Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You are signed on to the Precision Digital Webinar titled Loop versus Line Power, Understanding 2, 3, and 4-Wire Signals. This is the third webinar in a series of three which were all about 4 to 20 milliamp process signals. This series of webinars was designed as a basic course covering the fundamentals for those of the folks out there who deal with 4 to 20 milliamp signals and connections all the time, but you're not full-fledged electrical engineers. Not that we don't welcome any electrical engineers out there. We certainly do. If you missed webinar one, which was fundamentals of 4 to 20 milliamp current loops, or webinar two, loop powered devices, you can still view these if you go to the Precision Digital website, www.predig predig.com slash webinars. And we'll show that link on the, when we finish up at the end too, and it'll be in the slide deck when you get that. Speaking of getting the slide deck, general housekeeping, as uh, everyone who registered for this webinar will get a follow-up email within a few days, and you'll get a link to the recorded webinar, and you'll also get a link to the PDF slide deck. So everyone gets that, it might be a few days, but we'll get that out to you. Or again, you can check in at the Predig Precision Digital website and in a few days, and they'll be posted up there as well. So everyone's in listen only mode. That means you can't speak to us via your microphone, but we would like to hear from you with questions. And the way to submit a question is in your lower left-hand corner of your control panel in the chat window, just type in a question when it comes to your mind. We'll be having a couple of sessions, live question and answer, where we pick questions and answer them live, one in the middle and one at the end. So, uh, so you don't have to wait for that point in the webinar. Just type in a question and we'll be accumulating them as we go. So, and again, we encourage you to type in a question. This webinar, as mentioned, is being recorded. And once again, everyone who registered will get a copy, um, an email with the link to the, to the recording. So let's try something here. In, uh, if everyone notes that you can raise your hand virtually in the control panel, so if anyone would, anyone who attended webinar one or webinar two, you could raise your hand. Let's see if it works. So just raise your hand if you attended either one of the previous two webinars in this series. Okay, good. Looks like it's working, Joe. That we'll give excellent. a few minutes. We'll give a few seconds here and get an idea. Okay, quite a few folks. Great, thanks for doing that. Now I am going to lower everyone's hand. Okay. We're good. Great. The next slide is presenters. Today, speaking for Precision Digital, my name is Bruce McDuffie. I am with the Precision Digital Marketing Department. I'm your moderator today, and I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado today. Beautiful Boulder. Ryan Shea is working behind the scenes in the chat window. Ryan is an applications specialist with Precision Digital. He deals with questions about 4 to 20 milliamps every day, as well as other process signals. And Ryan is with us today from the Precision Digital headquarters in Holliston, Massachusetts. And our main speaker today is Joe Ryan. Joe is a product manager with Precision Digital. He's got 10 plus years of experience with all types of process signals product design, support, manufacturing, and marketing of process measurement and control devices. Joe has extensive field experience and support experience with all types of process signals, especially 4 to 20 milliamps. Joe is with us today uh, from the Precision Digital headquarters in Holliston, Massachusetts. And with that introduction, Joe, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you very much, Bruce. So first, why don't we take a look at the objectives and takeaways for this webinar so you know what we're going to be covering. The most important element of this, of course, 
is that we want you to leave understanding the fundamental differences between two, three, and four wire connections, uh, both in terms of how the networks get set up, how all of the wiring works, as well as how the individual devices function. That's going to allow you to determine the best choice for your applications, whether or not you should start off at looking at two, three, or four wire systems when you're looking for an application solution. And then make the best choice for the instruments, meters, and other devices that are going to be going into those two, three, or four wire systems. The way we're going to give you that information is by following the agenda that you see here. First, we're going to briefly define Ohm's Law, which is the basic fundamental engineering equation. We're not going to be doing any math. However, we want people to understand how it is current flows and how voltage is related so that as we move further into the presentation, you'll have a basic understanding of that. Then we're going to look at a two, a three, and a four wire system. What is it that makes them two, three, or four wires? What are those two, three, or four pins that you'll see on those devices? We'll talk about the pros and cons of each type of two, three, and four wire device and system. And then we're going to briefly review the essentials you need to know. And to do that, we're going to do um, an analysis of, of a couple of actual real-world examples showing, for example, PLCs connected up to transmitters, connected up to power supplies, and how all those different connections and wires relate to one another. But before we move on, uh, Bruce, you had some questions. Yeah, it's always fun to see who's out there in the audience, not only for us, but also for you folks out there listening in, because you can't see the list of attendees. So we just got a few polling questions to get a feel for who the audience is. The first question is, where are you located? So if you can just select the region you're located, and then we can share the results as they come in, which I think is kind of fun. Last couple of webinars, the Eastern U.S. was the most represented. Let's see if the, another region can come in this time. Folks are voting. Thanks for sharing and participating. Makes it interesting. So well, yeah, looks like, okay, last chance to vote. A few more coming in. I'll go ahead and close the poll. A couple more. They're still coming in. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And we can see the results. Eastern, right in a row. Look at that. Eastern, Central, Western Canada, and other. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for, for the great those. participation. Yeah. Okay, what industry? What is your industry? We're limited to 10 on this, so uh, we'll see how we did. We tried to minimize other, but see how we do on this. And we'll show the results as they come in and just pick your industry or the one that's closest to what you work in. Good diverse group this time. Very nice. Coming in. Industrial distributors, by far the biggest group. You get a mix, looks like manufacturing, public utilities, consulting, and other. There's that other group again. I guess that means we just have a good diverse group. Okay, go ahead and close the poll. As chance closed. Okay, and there's the results. And one more poll before we get into the actual material. This one is, this helps Joe to tailor a little bit of what he speaks about. So which, with which type of connection are you most familiar? Wire. It's not surprising two wire is the most familiar. That's probably the most prevalent. I met. Coming in. Thanks for voting, everyone. I hope you find this interesting. I think it's neat to see who else is out there and have the mix. Some 16% not familiar with any, Joe. Well, that's interesting. We'll definitely be covering them all. 
So hopefully they'll learn some useful information. Yeah. Four wire, only 2.6%. Wow. I'll go ahead and close the poll. Last chance. Okay. Here's the result. It's actually we'll interesting see. to see how many people are familiar with two wire. I was expecting uh, some, some four wire results really to be most popular. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And Joe, back to you. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is cover a couple basic definitions. And the most basic of those is Ohm's law. So Ohm's law is that voltage is equal to current times resistance, or the voltage drop across any specific element of a current loop is going to be equal to the amount of current going through that element times its equivalent resistance. And when we are talking about voltages and currents, et cetera, in this webinar, we are going to be mostly talking about DC signals. And that's because the, the 4 to 20 milliamp signal that's ubiquitous out there in all of your applications is a DC signal being powered by a DC power supply, a direct current power supply. Later on, we may see a little bit of high voltage AC power supply discussion. But for the most part, if I don't say something otherwise or label it otherwise, we're going to be talking about a 4 to 20 milliamp DC signal. And the real takeaway from this is just to understand that in a 4 to 20 milliamp system, I'm going to have uh, some kind of DC power supply, and that's this VTOT that you see here on the left, and I just marked that with the arrow. And it's going to be providing the voltage that's needed to drive the current. The current is going to be driving in this current loop I, and it's going to go through all the devices on the network, and it's going to come back into the power supply. As it does so, it's going to be crossing through all sorts of different devices, in this case R1, R2, and R3, which could represent anything. Those could, those could be the inputs to a PLC. They could be the entirety of a two-wire loop power display. There's all sorts of different things those could be but each one is going to generate a DC voltage drop in it, and that voltage drop is determined by that V equals IR equation. So the key takeaway from this is just that 4 to 20 milliamp is always going to be DC. You're going to have voltage drops on all of your uh, equivalent resistances, all of your devices that are put in that 4 to 20 loop. And the most important thing to understand, which is the current I is the same everywhere in that loop. You'll see that there's just one value of I, and then it's path shown, whereas there's a V1 and a V2 and a V3 and a V total, and different resistances at R1, R2, and R3, but I is the same everywhere. Then we've got a couple definitions for other, other elements you're going to see here. Um, each of these configurations produces a 4 to 20 milliamp current signal, or is involved with a 4 to 20 milliamp current signal. 4 to 20 milliamps is a very low current. So to you put that in perspective, the current coming out of your wall supply or, or the current coming out of a, um, a wall plug at a house is usually capable of putting out 15 amps. These process signals run at 4 to 20 milliamps DC. So this is a very small, relatively safe, volt, uh, very, relatively safe current. And it's the standard everywhere, which is why we're, we're doing so much work discussing it. Um, we have other webinars a little more in detail into what the 4 to 20 milliamp current loop is all about, and you can find those at predig.com. Um, but it's important to understand that that's what that 4 to 20 is. We're talking about the process signal that you're sending. The other thing I want to make mention of is that most of the installations we're going to discuss include a power supply local to the transmitter or receiver. And that means that sometimes we're going to see the power supply is actually part of the transmitter itself. So for example, I may have an externally powered level transmitter that gives a powered 4 to 20 milliamp output. So that V total that we discussed that's needed to drive the loop is part of the transmitter itself. Um, and that's the same thing for a receiver side. The receiver could be anything in the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. Uh, let's say, for example, a panel meter. And that panel meter may have a power supply built into it that drives the 4 to 20 milliamp output. 
or they're going to have some kind of a power supply located in close proximity to them. So the power supplies we're talking about here could be in a couple of different locations, and they will be when we look at some examples. But it's always the device that's providing the power to run the 4 to 20 milliamp loop, meaning they're usually some kind of DC power supply. Now let's talk about the actual 2, 3, and 4 wire connections using the terms we just discussed. So what is a, what is a 2 wire device or 2 wire loop? Well, a two wire device is also known as a loop power device. And a two wire system means that it only runs on a current loop. Those are the only wires involved in that system. So you can see in the title of the slide, we call it two wire current loop and loop power. Because if you're talking two wires, that's what your two wires are. You have two wires involved in any given device, and those two wires are just used to run a current loop. Now there has to be power coming in from somewhere, and that's usually provided either by a built-in power supply on the transmitter or receiver, or in some cases using an external power supply. If you look at this chart, uh, this layout to the right, you can see exactly what I mean about the two wires. Wire one, playing at the top here. Wire two, showing at the bottom. And any given device is going to be connected up to those two wires. Now this is a simple system, but you can see that I've got a wire here, a wire here, and a wire here. So I suppose actually there's three, technically three wires being shown here. But if you look at any given device, take for example the transmitter. My transmitter, which is this box on the left, has two wires connected to it. I've got the positive side and the negative side. My power supply, again, is only going to be connected up to two wires in this loop, the positive side and the negative side. And my receiver, or my resistor as it's modeled here, which could be a panel meter, a chart recorder, a PLC, is going to have two connections on it, the positive side and the negative side. So any given device in this two-wire system has just two wires connected. And we'll talk about this a little bit more with some actual examples that will hopefully help make that a little more clear. By contrast, you've got four-wire systems. A four-wire system means that my devices are not loop power devices. They're not getting all of their power from the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. A four-wire system uses a 4 to 20 milliamp current loop on all the devices in the loop, but those devices are also externally powered. The transmitter and the receiver, uh, generally those float. And what that means is that if you look at the chart over on the left here, I've got my transmitter, my TRX, and I've got four different connections coming into there. I've got a wire connection here, a wire connection here, there, and here. So that is a four-wire transmitter. Wire one is coming from the uh, 4 to 20, I'm sorry, wire 1 is coming from the power supply, and then you've got wire 2 going back to the common of the power supply, so that's how it's getting its power. It's getting its power from this externally connected power supply. And then I've got wire 3 being my 4 to 20 milliamp out going to my receiver, and wire 4 being the wire that brings back from the receiver to my transmitter. And by floating, what we mean is that the common the return from the receiver to the transmitter, which is this wire here, doesn't connect up to the power supply ground. It's an isolated system, generally. And so I don't have any actual electrical connections between my power supply common and the return on that 4 to 20. Now, because this is externally powered, I can be AC or DC powered. Um, 24 volts AC is common, but so is 24 volts DC, 120 volts AC, 240 volts AC. It's all going to depend on the device. Because I've got an external power connection here, this power supply loop really could be anything just defined by whatever the device specs are. 
And then we've got three wire connections. A three wire device is essentially the same thing as a four wire device, but it doesn't have the isolation built into it. The 4 to 20 milliamp loop isn't floating by comparison to the power supply. And what I mean by that is that if you look again at this transmitter, it's got wire 1 which brings in power. It's got wire 2 which is its 4 to 20 milliamp output going to the receivers. But then wire 3 is shared between the return from the receiver and the common of the power supply. They're literally the same connection. Um, some three-wire devices will have four terminals just to make your wiring easier, but essentially it's the same electrical node. So my 4 to 20 milliamp loop is not electrically isolated from my power supply. With those basic discussions out of the way, before we move on to some more in-depth discussion and examples, um, Bruce, you had another question. Yeah, I've got another poll question here. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention um, Joe's got some great real-life examples coming up of each of those different scenarios. So if you're confused so far, don't worry. It's going to get clearer. Right, Joe? Absolutely. Um, I know with just some basic diagrams, it can be tough to wrap your brain around it, but I wanted to put the comments in your head, or put the concepts in your head before we move on to some actual examples with transmitters and meters, et cetera. Exactly. Great. So this question is, what are your primary 4 to 20 milliamp applications? And you can pick more than one in this poll if you do deal with more than one. Take a look at the results as they come in. Like flow level and pressure are neck and neck. Thanks for voting, everyone. Interesting. Other, about 14% other. Temperature, no humidity. Wow, that's, yeah. So, I would say based on this, the majority of the folks out there deal with at least three applications. We want in, a few more coming in. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, looks like everyone's voted who wants to. Close the poll. And there's the results. Again, a good mix. Good mix of applications. Okay, thanks everyone. Now we're going to take a break for some questions. And we've got a couple of questions in. And again, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat window and we'll get to as many as we can today. First question is, why is it not zero to 20 milliamps? Or why is zero to 20 milliamps not being used and it's four to 20? Well, that's a great question. Um, I can give you two fairly simple answers to that one. Um, the, first an the first reason is that the 4 to 20 milliamp signal is an inheritor to the legacy of a pneumatic signal that was usually around something like 3 or 4 PSI to 15. And so the systems were set up not to have an absolute zero as their zero percent. And one of the reasons why that was the case or was for the same reason that we still keep it as 4 to 20 now, which is by not having a 0% output or a 0% signal actually be 0 milliamps, it's easy to detect when you have an actual error in your system. If you had a 0 to 20 milliamp range, then I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a wire being cut and my signal just being at 0%. There'd be no distinguishing uh, features to it. It's just uh, an open circuit is a 0 milliamp circuit. By making it 4 milliamps at 0% of signal, now I can tell the difference between having 0% signal and having a wire cut or having a device that has lost power or some other actual mechanical failure element. Um, that, that's one of the big reasons why you see that. There's, there's others in there as well, such as increasing noise immunity and the difficulty of earlier devices actually being able to produce for uh, ranges of milliamps that go down to zero, 
producing 0 milliamps obviously is easy, but trying to get something to produce a, a 0 to 1 milliamp range output is actually pretty expensive and tricky. Um, but the big reason is that it allows you to tell the difference between a failed system and an active system that's just showing 0. Okay, good. We have a question, a clarifying question from Jim. He says uh, in a question mark, the receiver could be, for example, a chart recorder? Uh, that's absolutely right. The, the receiving element, what we call here the receiver, uh, is any device that's taking that 4 to 20 milliamps and doing something with it. The transmitter part of the circuit is what's generating and regulating that 4 to 20 milliamps. Everything that's just reading it in some way could be a receiver. So that could be a chart recorder. It could be a PLC. It could be a panel meter. Um, it could be different types of those devices as well. Uh, it could be a, a two-wire loop-powered panel meter. It could be a four-wire externally powered panel meter. But it's anything that's reading that 4 to 20 milliamp loop. Okay. okay. And Chris has a question. Is the resistor always the same in the receiver, for example, 500 ohms? Um, it's not. Now, usually you're going to see some small resistance value in a four-wire device. Uh, you're going to get some kind of a sense resistor in there that could be, say, around 10 ohms. Um, but that's not guaranteed. It, it could be unique for every device, and every manufacturer is going to have a slightly different approach to it. Um, the, uh, the resistor that we actually put into those diagrams is what we call an equivalent resistance, though which means it's not just the actual sense resistor the device is using to measure current. It's the quote-unquote equivalent resistance of the device that you use to determine voltage drop. I know I'm getting a little in-depth there with the, with the equivalent resistance, and we have some other webinars that talk about that topic, but essentially that's important for two-wire loop-powered devices because even though they may have a very small sense resistor physically built into the unit, they have a much larger voltage drop than that sense resistor is going to generate because they're also taking voltage there to power themselves up and operate. Okay. Here's a question from Barry. Barry's question is, if the power supply and the signal are the same voltage, what is the advantage or disadvantage of the 4 versus 3 wire? Um, Maybe that goes into our next, our next section. Yes, why don't I cover that a little bit? Um, the answer to your question is, just to make sure everyone understands, I guess the question first, is let's say I'm using, if I understand it right, let's say I'm using a 24-volt DC power supply to run my 4 to 20 milliamp loop. I believe the question is asking, well, then what's the advantage of having a four-wire device when I'm using a 24-volt power supply to externally power the device as well? And uh, and I think we'll cover that in the next few slides. And if we have not, then I would encourage that questionnaire to ask again, and we'll cover it in the next question section. Okay, fair enough. Let's take one more question, and then we'll move on. This is from a nice short one from Tom. Tom says, is there a maximum resistance to the loop? Uh, there absolutely is. So the resistance of the loop Deter is determined or helps determine the voltage drop of the loop. And it is very critical that the voltage drop in all of those receiver elements be less than the voltage being provided by the power supply. So if I have a 24 volt power supply somewhere, it could be external, it could be built into the transmitter or one of the receivers, but if I have a 24 volt power supply running my 4 to 20 milliamp loop, then I need to make sure that all of the voltage drops in my loop don't add up to be more than 24 volts. Otherwise, I'm going to have a failure in my signal. So those resistive elements, which are essentially the, the voltage drop characteristics that you see on a, on a two-wire data sheet for a two-wire device, those voltage drops need to be added up and can't go more than 24 volts. So if you're looking at them in terms of equivalent resistance, you can use that Ohm's law we discussed earlier and say, all right, what's the total resistance of my loop? Multiply that by 20 milliamps, the point at which I'm going to get the most voltage drop, and it's going to give you the total maximum voltage drop of your loop, which needs to be under your power supply voltage. 
hopefully that clarifies that for you. Okay, good. Thanks for your questions, everyone. Uh, keep them coming in. Again, we've got another question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. So uh, we'll get to the ones we can, and, but keep them coming. Thanks, everyone. Go back to the pros and cons. So I know there's been some questions already circulating about pros and cons, so let's see if we can answer some of those, shall we? We'll start with two-wire, or loop-powered pro and cons. The biggest pro for two-wire systems and two-wire devices is that it's a simple and easy way to hook up your 4 to 20 milliamp displays and transmitters. You've just got generally two terminals on your device and you're just running two wires to it, and everything runs in one big loop. So when you're sketching this out, making schematics for your plant, or trying to explain to someone how to troubleshoot it, it's very easy to understand. Another advantage to it is that these are generally low cost solutions. Because the manufacturers don't have to pay for expensive power supply elements in their devices, you can get these usually less expensively than you would if you were getting the equivalent three or four wire device where they need to include an internal power supply to actually run the device itself. If you're in hazardous areas, it's very easy to get agency approvals on two wire devices. Um, both expulsion proof and intrinsically safe devices are available um, in two wire device form. And it's very common to, uh, to find just about any application that has a two wire device has a hazardous area approved equivalent device for it. And local power is not needed, which is a convenience factor for doing the actual installation. If I have a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter somewhere out in a tank farm, and I'm trying to bring that 4 to 20 milliamp signal back in my, contro my control room, I may have power both at the tank and at the control room. But if I want to put a display somewhere in the middle, I may not have power local to that display point. Using a two-wire display or a loop power display, I can put the display right where I want it, and I don't have to worry about running DC or AC power to it. So there's a major convenience factor to using two-wire because you don't have to have a power supply there in the field where you're putting your two-wire device. There are some pros to two-wire, however. A two-wire device isn't powered externally. It's loop powered, getting all of its power from that 4 to 20 loop, which means it's not going to have a whole lot of power to work with. If you have a, a two-wire device, it may have, say, a 3-volt drop, and it's only running that 3 volts at, at most, 20 milliamps, but as low as 4 milliamps. You have very low power consumption, which means you can't run electromechanical relays. You can't run bright sunlight readable LEDs. That's why you usually find things like open collector outputs or um, LCD displays on these two wire devices. Four wire devices um, have different pros. They, the first, given what we were just talking about, is that you can get a lot more capability out of them. Because they have external power supplies, there's a lot more they can do because the, the current and voltage that's available to them is just greater. This is where you're going to see your relay outputs, your sunlight readable LEDs, high-speed serial communications like Modbus, Profibus, etc. Um, they have easier to understand wiring for people who aren't familiar with the whole concept of loop-powered devices. Um, while it may be common in some of the applications and fields that you're in, it's not something that's common everywhere. And most people are used to this idea of, well, I'm going to power a device from a wall outlet, or I'm going to power a device from 120 volts AC, and then it's going to do some other things with a different signal. The idea of getting your power from your process signal loop is confusing to some people. And so if they haven't had exposure to that, the four-wire device is much easier to wrap their head around. And the four-wire device is generally a great choice for isolation. Normally, these devices will have an isolation barrier of some kind between their input power that runs the device and the 4 to 20 milliamp loop, and possibly even the power supply it's using to drive the loop if it gives a, an onboard power supply or an active 4 to 20 milliamp output. And that isolation is going to be very useful if you have complex 4 to 20 milliamp systems running 
or if you have a lot of power supply noise. There are cons to 4-wire. Obviously, it needs a separate local power supply. I've got to be bringing power into this 4-wire device separately than my 4 to 20 milliamp signal. So I either need to have a, a power rail that's already running to the area where I want to put my device, or I need to go out there and get some kind of power supply installed locally. Because the devices get externally powered, they have to have a, a power supply circuit internal to the device to handle that. And that adds cost to the devices, so they will generally be more expensive. There's more wiring requirements. This is especially important for hazardous areas, um, where you, or areas where you need to run all of your wiring through conduits separately. Because now, not only do I have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, I've got a power supply signal that I've got to bring out there as well. And running that long distances through conduits can be expensive, time consuming, and make it more difficult to troubleshoot. And there's limited hazardous area options, especially for those of you who work in intrinsically safe preferred environments. While there are some intrinsically safe DC powered devices, for the most part, you're going to be limited to larger, bulkier, explosion proof equipment if you're going with a four wire device. And that increases cost dramatically over an intrinsically safe two wire counterpart. And then there's three wire. So three wire devices don't have a lot of isolation. They're, and so they're generally lower cost than the four wire devices. They're easier to wire because now you've only got three wires you need to run. And because they're electrically connected, you may even be able to share conduits, etc. On the con side, however, they don't have that isolation, which means they're very susceptible to ground loops. So if you have a complex system of 4 to 20 milliamp outputs, for example, you have multiple process signals all coming into the same PLC bank, you need to be very careful about ground loops and shared signal nodes. And if you don't know what you're doing there, and you're using a three-wire device, you could find yourself having all sorts of signal problems. And though you have less wires, a three-wire device is somewhat complicated to wrap your head around. You've got two different circuits that are both sharing the same wire. And it's difficult to understand how they're going to interact and when that's going to cause difficulty. So to understand the essentials of this a little better, and maybe make it a little more clear, why don't we take a look at really what the essentials are you should know when we get out of this webinar. The must-know points. Four-wire and three-wire systems or devices use external power supplies. They need some power coming into those devices that is not the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. I know there's some people out there that don't trust three-wire systems, but they do work, and there are plenty of three-wire devices out there. However, you have to be aware of your isolation requirements and how different process signals are going to be shared if they're going through a single device like a PLC before you get involved with them or you're going to be inviting problems. So if you are not confident in your ability to wire those up and not have ground loops or shared signals, then you might want to steer away from three wire devices and go for something that's more isolated. Two wire devices are extremely easy to install. They have a lot of great advantages, but you have to be aware of the voltage drop. Well, the drops will be significant on two-wire devices. And if, for example, I have an 18-volt drop on my two-wire level transmitter, and I want to put several three-volt drop displays along the way back to the control room, well, I'm going to run into a problem really fast. So you have to be aware of your voltage drops if you're going to use two-wire, or they will fail on you. A good rule of thumb to keep in mind is that your two-wire devices are, in general, going to be much less expensive than your three or four wire devices. They're going to be cheaper to buy, and they're going to be cheaper to install. Three wire will be slightly less expensive than four wire, and that can be good for some cost savings, but you need to be aware of the problems that three wire brings with it. And lastly, though two wire has a lot of advantages, some devices just aren't going to be available as two wire devices. If you want LEDs on your device, or if you want relays to, that are going to be used to turn lights or pumps or motors on or off, 
you're not going to get those in a two-wire device. You, you can't find a two-wire device that doesn't need some other form of power to run those power-intensive outputs like that, um, to run things like Modbus communications. You're very limited in what you can get in a two-wire device. So here's a few examples that we talked about earlier. And this is a nice, simple example of a two-wire system. Uh, at the top of the system, you'll see I've got this 120 VAC to 24 VDC supply. Um, what we've got modeled here is just a DIN rail mounted power supply, but this could also be a, a 24 volt rail that I just run off throughout my plant, um, or any other number of types of 24 volt supplies. This supply gives the voltage my loop needs to run. So my current will come down this wire into, in this case, my loop powered flow meter out of my flow meter and into my uh, loop powered meter for a display for either the rate or the total. Then it's going to come out of my loop powered meter and back into my power supply. The current is the same everywhere in that loop. And as far as the process signal is concerned, if I look at any one of those devices, I've just got two wires. Two terminals for my loop powered flow meter, two terminals for my loop power display, and the two terminals on the power supply that are driving it. So that's a great two wire system and it really drives home the simplicity in what you can do even though you've only got those two wires in the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. Now let's contrast that with this four wire system, which instantly you can see is a more complicated system to understand. In my bottom right, I've got my AC power rail. I have to have that because much like the last system we saw in the lower left here, I've got a 120 to 24 volt supply. However, after that, it gets a little more complicated. Now I have a four wire device level transmitter. So I've got power going from the 24 volt supply to the transmitter, and then I've got power coming back from the transmitter. Then the transmitter's got its 24 volt output. I'm, I'm sorry, it's 4 to 20 milliamp output. And it's got a 4 to 20 milliamp return. So there's my four wires on my four wire transmitter. The grade level display at the bottom of the tank is actually powered by 120 AC. So it's got to have connections to the AC power rail which weren't necessary in the last example. And then it's also going to have its milliamp input and its milliamp output. So there's my four wires for my four wire display device. And then I've got a PLC that just has a 4 to 20 milliamp input and output. And it's powered also from the AC rail. And so you can see the four wires going to that. So even though each device only has four wires, it actually gets fairly complicated to see where everything is getting its power from versus where everything is, is connected up for the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. And in this case, I've got to have power at each one of these devices. My PLC and my panel meter need to be connected up to the AC power rail, so I'm, I'm hoping that I have power nearby that connect me to that. Otherwise, I'm going to have to run those wires. And my 24 volt power level transmitter needs to be somewhere near this 24 volt supply, which also needs to be near my AC power rail. So I need to have power at every one of these locations where this system isn't going to work. Then I've got the slightly less complicated three wire example. Now, I should say it's actually more complicated. It's less wires, but the wires do tend to be more confusing. Much like the last example, I've got my PLC powered by my AC power rail, which is also running lines to my 24 volt supply. My 24 volt supply, however, has the, a power supply pin that goes to both the grade level display and the top of tank level transmitter. So in this case, my panel meter here, my three wire panel meter is running on DC power. 
the return of the power supply is connected up to a common pin on both the level transmitter and the display. Now that common pin is the same common that's used on my 4 to 20 milliamp loop. So that means my 4 to 20 milliamp loop is connected directly to the power supply that's also running those two devices. And that was not the case in the last example. Now, for those of you who are a little worried about using three-wire devices and concerned when I say that you need to understand exactly what you're doing or you could be running into some trouble, I have a great example here that will show you what kind of trouble you can get into. Let's assume for a minute that this PLC, instead of using AC power, was actually connected up to my DC power supply. So let's just assume for a moment that those pins don't actually run to the AC power supply, but let's assume for a minute that they run to the DC power supply. Well, if this were a three-wire three PLC, that would mean that my negative on the power supply would actually share this common, and that the uh, positive on my power supply would actually connect up to this power supply pin. There's a problem with that. What that means is that when power is now coming out of my power supply on my P plus pin, well, if I look at my P minus pin, it's actually not, it's actually connecting directly up to my, um, connecting up directly to my PLC as part of that 4 to 20 milliamp loop, and it's connecting up this return line and I'm going to find that I start having shared current running all throughout this system. Because my signal minus here that's coming out of the PLC is actually shared right there. And so I know that sounds a little confusing. Let me try to make it a little more clear. So my current loop will now come out of the loop uh, out of the level transmitter into my PLC, out of my PLC, and then it's going to immediately jump, or it's actually going to pass through there, come out this common, go back to there, uh, at the common of the level transmitter. However, this negative on the PLC is also connected up to the P minus which means I'm actually shorting out my panel meter. It gets a little confusing, and I understand if you didn't follow along, but that's the, that's the problem of three-wire systems. By not fully understanding how the current's flowing here, I just accidentally took my four-wire PLC in my three-wire system, hooked it up to the DC power supply, and shorted out my panel meter, and now my panel meter is not getting a signal. So those are the kinds of complexities you have to be aware of in these three-wire systems. And you need to carefully map out how all those current flows are going to work and where all those pins are going to connect, or you're going to find strange things may start to happen. So in summary, we talked about a couple of definitions. We talked about Ohm's law, how current's the same everywhere in a loop, and your 4 to 20 milliamp loop just flows in a in a big current circle out of one element, looping around everything else in the circuit and coming right back into it. We talked briefly about how two-wire systems are made up of two-wire devices, which are also loop-powered devices, meaning they only have two wires for their current in and their current out. We talked about three- and four-wire systems, which involve external power supplies, and in the case of a three-wire system, a shared common between the current return and the DC power return. We talked a little about the pros and cons of each type, and we gave you some basic examples. Um, before we get to our final question session, Bruce, you had another question. Yeah. Good, good info, Joe. Um, very interesting. 
This question is, how often do you specify digital displays? And don't worry, we're not going to jump on you if you specify a lot. We're just looking for the information. We will only contact you if you had requested contact in the registration or you requested in the post-meeting survey. So let's see how often people are specifying. The results coming in. Fast and furious, I might add. And looks like three to ten times the most popular. Still voting, I'll give it a few more seconds here before we move on to the question and answer session. Okay, let's go ahead and close out the poll. See the results. Thanks everyone for providing that information. Found it interesting as well. Okay, let's go on to the final question and answer session and we've got some good questions coming in here. You guys are really paying attention. That's great. Here's one from Edward and maybe this is a emphasis of the pros and cons. Let's see. Edward says, "How do you choose the best wiring How do you choose the best wiring configuration for an application?" Whether it's two Well, or I think that what you really need to do is determine what your application requires. Generally the way I do it is I try to use two wire devices whenever possible because they're so easy to use. However, if I see that something's called for like a relay or like Modbus communications, or I know that having available DC power is going to be a problem, then I start thinking, okay, a two wire device isn't really going to work here. I may need something that's going to have those relays or have that uh, LED display or have Modbus communications or if no DC power is available, something that's powered by 120 AC. So I usually start with a loop powered solution and then I look for reasons I have to disqualify it and change over to something else. Okay, great. And this question is, goes along with that one I think. This is from David. He says, how common is it to be able to choose between two, three, and four wire systems? Usually the type is forced by the equipment supplier and what is available. Um, well, I guess the answer to your question is, it, is that it, determines, or it depends on what level you're getting involved in the specification at. If you're at the very beginning of a specification, uh, let's say I know that I'm putting in a, a new line of flow and it's going to be pumping water through my water treatment plant. Well, at the very beginning, I can now make some determinations. Are we going to have power available? Um, what kind of power supplies do I want to have available for other instrumentation in the area? Um, do I want to have a power supply at every point I intend to have the display? Or do I want to consider putting some loop power displays to get displays in remote areas? Um, so in those cases, you have a lot of flexibility to build your system. Now, you are right in that if you're walking into a system that already exists or something which, which has already been partially specified, then you're going to be much more restricted. If I know, for example, that the transmitter has already been chosen for my flow meter and it requires 24 volts, well, okay, then, then I know that I already have a four-wire transmitter device. There's really no reason for me to be worried about power being available. Um, so I, I guess the answer to your question is, the, how often you get to specify whether you're using a three, four, or two wire device is really determined by what stage you are in the application solution. Okay, good. Randy has a question. If you have a two wire receiver and a three wire transmitter, can you or how do you wire the three wire transmitter to the two wire receiver? Well, if I have a, and let me get this right, that was a, a two-wire transmitter, three-wire receiver? No, other way around. Two-wire receiver, okay. three-wire transmitter. Okay. Well, my three-wire transmitter is going to require external power. So I'm going to bring whatever that power is. If it's, if it's three-wire, it's going to be DC power. So let's say I bring my 24 volts DC power supply and wire that up to my three-wire transmitter. And then my transmitter is going to have a, 
a 4 to 20 milliamp signal out pin. So all I need to do is take my two-wire receiver, let's say it's a two-wire panel meter, a loop-powered panel meter, and I'm going to take that signal output pin from the three-wire transmitter, wire it into the signal plus of my loop-powered meter, and then bring the uh, signal minus pin of my two-wire meter and bring it back to the common of the three-wire transmitter. Um, because even though I've got a three-wire transmitter, my loop power meter is still a two-wire device. It's just got the 4 to 20 milliamp loop running through it. Okay. I hope I'm going to probably mispronounce his first name, but Huey asks, how do you limit the current between 4 and 20 milliamps? Um, well, that's the job of the transmitter. Um, now, I don't want to get too technical here because that's often an entirely different discussion. Um, but essentially, what the, the transmitter is going to have current regulatory circuits in it um, that are going to be responsible for doing that. And it's going to be regulating it into some programmable or preset range. And while it's a great question, and we can talk to you about it a little offline, um, the circuits, ICs, uh, and, the, and the logic that go into regulating that current is probably a little too in-depth for this webinar discussion. Okay. David has a question. Can a four-wire system be used as a two-wire system? Well, yes and no. Um, you can find a four-wire solution to do everything that a two-wire solution will do. You're just going to find it more complicated because you're going to have to provide external power at all those four wire devices. But there's absolutely, with the exception of possibly approvals, nothing you're going to find that a two wire system does that a four wire system cannot. Okay, I think we better wrap it up here. I guess we have time for one more question, Joe. Okay. And this question, seems we get this on all the webinars, so I'm going to bring it up again. Tom asks, can you explain a ground loop? Sure. So current always wants to flow in loops. Um, if I go back to a previous slide, uh, let's see here. Current always wants to flow in loops. And, and here you can see I've got this current loop right here. Um, it's a nice, easy to understand current loop. What happens with a ground loop is that I get a different current loop that decides it's going to start mixing in signals with a different current loop. So um, for example, if you'll pardon my drawing skills, uh, if I were to, uh, let's try that again. If I were to build a current loop up here, I have a couple of resistors in it. Forgive me, folks, I'm drawing with a mouse, so things can get kind of difficult. Getting pretty good with that, though, Joe. I'm working on it. So if I have a current loop up here, I have two distinct current loops. Um, I guess in this case, my current would be flowing in this direction. And they're not touching. They're essentially separate drawings, and everyone's happy. What happens a lot of the time with ground loops is that because of the way a device, essentially like a three-wire device, shares its commons, you start getting those two current paths crossed. And so what happens is, uh, let's say I had uh, this R1 as a device that has multiple 4 to 20 milliamps coming through it. Like let's say that's a PLC with multiple 4 to 20s coming in. Well, that PLC is going to have multiple inputs, and so it's going to have multiple equivalent resistances here. And if all of the commons on that PLC are shared, then I no longer have nice, clean paths of current. I now have a current loop up here and a current loop down there. But because they share this node, I'm going to get strange paths of current that want to start crossing over into these loops. And the minute that starts happening, I now have a much less predictable system. My, my values further on in the loop are going to be uh, very inaccurate. 
because I've got my power supply that's coming through the PLC, but then some of the current is going up into that top circuit, some of the current is coming down into the lower circuit, and everything is not the same everywhere, and so my system breaks down on me. So a ground loop is what happens when you've got grounds, commons, or returns that are shared between various loops, and current starts crossing paths between all these different loops. And the minute that happens, you're in a lot of trouble because now you no longer have predictable, usable current values flowing. Hopefully that, that okay. brief example explains it for you. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. We're just about out of time, so we're just going to wrap it up now. This, as mentioned, this is the last of the, the number three of a three-part series, about 4 to 20 milliamp loops and current and signals. <clears throat> so we're looking for input from you, the audience members, of other things you'd like us to cover, other educational topics. Could be more specific topics, about 4 to 20, like a webinar about ground loops or a webinar about signal to noise, signal noise and such. So you can even type it into the chat window now if you like. If you have some ideas that are top of mind, go ahead and chat them in to us and, or send us an email, and we'd love to have your input. This series was very popular. We were thrilled with, the, with that we could share this information with folks. So just t chat something in there for us, and, or again, email us or give us a call, and we'd love to hear from you. This webinar was created and produced by Precision Digital Corporation in Holliston, Mass. And we didn't talk about products, really. We just want to make it educational. But if you do have interest in loop-powered meters or digital panel meters, explosion-proof instruments, large display meters, anything along that line, if you're in the market for that product or have questions about them, please give us a call. Give us a call or send us an email. Naturally, we'd love to talk about the products. Or on the other hand, if you just have questions about 4 to 20 milliamp um, and you're not in the market to buy something, call us anyways. We'll be glad to help you out. Thanks again for attending. There's our contact information. We do have a survey that's coming your way as soon as we close out this webinar. And we'd love to have you give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. Let us know how we could be better. So if you would take just a couple of minutes and Fill out that survey. It shows up automatically when we close out the webinar. So that is it for today, folks. Thank you very much for spending time with us, and we hope this was helpful. And again, have a great day. We'll sign off now. Thank you.